Hi, everybody. Um, thank you so much for joining us tonight um, for our event with Lucy Jane Bledsoe, Christina Quintana, um, aka CQ, and Naomi J. Williams. Um, we're all here tonight to celebrate the paperback launch of Lucy's latest book, Lava Falls. Um, I'm Evan Karp. I'm the events manager for Booksmith. We are an independent bookstore in the mainstay of San Francisco's Haight-Ashbury district since 1976. To celebrate the publication of Lava Falls, um, tonight, though, the new story collection by Lucy Jane Bledsoe, um, Lucy has invited CQ and Naomi J. Williams to discuss with her uh, what is the role of storytelling in the age of survival and how can stories serve the resistance. Um, I'm just going to um, uh, introduce them all briefly and um, go over a few house rules and then I'll get out of the way. Um, Christina Quintana, also known as CQ, is a queer writer with Cuban and Louisiana roots. CQ's plays and musicals have been developed and produced with companies including Barrington Stage Company, Southern Rep, INTAR, Ensemble Studio Theater, Lark Play Development Center, Astoria Performing Arts Center, and the Alliance Theater, among others. Her play Scissoring is available for licensing via Dramatist Play Service. Her poetry, fiction, and lyric nonfiction is published in Bowden, the online home of the McNeese Review, uh, P.S. I Love You, Pulp Mag, On Cuba, Nimrod International Journal, Foglifter Journal, and beyond, and is forthcoming in Great Weather for Media and The Punch Magazine. Her poem, Shelium, was featured on Radio Lab's Elements episode in collaboration with Emotive Fruition. Uh, and you can find out more about CQ and um, all the authors at booksmith.com. Um, Naomi J. Williams is the author of Landfalls, which came out um, through FSG in 2015. It was long listed for the Center for Fiction First Novel Prize and the National Book Critics Circle's John Lennon Award. Her short fiction has appeared in journals such as Zoetrope, All Story, A Public Space, One Story, The Southern Review, and The Gettysburg Review. Her distinctions include a Pushcart Prize, Best American Short Stories Honorable Mention, Sustainable Arts Foundation Grant, and residencies at Hedgebrook, Jirasi, and Willapa Bay Air. Naomi was born in Japan and spoke no English until she was six years old. Educated at Princeton, Stanford, and UC Davis, today she makes her home in Sacramento, California. She's taught creative writing at UC Davis, Sacramento City College, and a low residency MFA program at Ashland University in Ohio. She's hard at work on new writing projects, including a novel about the early 20th century Japanese poet Yosano Akiko. Um, and uh, finally, Lucy Jane Bledsoe is the author of eight books of fiction, including The Evolution of Love, Lava Falls, and A Thin Bright Line, which the New York Times has said triumphs as an intimate and humane evocation of day-to-day -day life under inhumane circumstances. Her fiction has won the California Arts Council Fellowship in Literature, an American Library Association Stonewall Award, the Arts and Letters Fiction Prize, a Pushcart nomination, a Yaddo Fellowship, and two National Science Foundation Artists and Writers Fellowships. Her stories have been translated into Japanese, Spanish, German, and Chinese. Bledsoe lives in the Bay Area. Um, Lucy, congratulations on the book. Um, it's so nice to see you again, and um, CQ and Naomi, Thank you um, so much for being here tonight. Um, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much, Evan and Booksmith and The Bindery for hosting us. Um, I just feel so happy to be here all, all, all at once. I'll just what I, I, We're here to celebrate my paperback version of Love of Falls, but truly what I wanted to do that celebration was just to have a conversation with other people who are writing stories and doing creative work. And I know that in the audience, we have a bunch of just amazing writers too, and um, some filmmakers. I know a couple that are in the audience. So I'm really, really, really feel already a little bit better uh, just being in this community of wonderful uh, creative people. Um, I immediately thought of CQ and Naomi when I thought, well, who do I want to be in conversation with? Um, so thank you so much for, for being here. Um, I guess I just want to start, I, we're going to have a conversation. We're each going to read for maybe two minutes at some point in the conversation. And then we also want to answer your questions um, and hear your thoughts. So we'll probably do that closer to the end. Um, the whole event will be about one hour. So um, thank you all for being here. I understand we have a nice big audience and I, I really, really appreciate you taking the time to talk with us. Um, I'm hoping to have an honest conversation tonight. Um, Basically, it's my belief that if you aren't feeling absolutely devastated right now, you're not conscious. <laughs> um, and I just want to be honest about that. Um, I don't need to enumerate the devastations that are racking up, but I'll just say, you know, on a scale of one to 10, my sadness level is at about a 10 and my fear levels at about an eight. <laughs> um, and so I, 
I recently decided that I just was going to retire the word hope and replace it with action. Um, and I need to know a lot more about what that means for me and for other people. Um, so I just want to start by asking you both, how are you doing? Um, and whether you think storytelling counts as action. It's a good question. Naomi, do you want to start? Oh, you go ahead. You go ahead. Um, you know, I've been asking myself this question. It's such a good question, Lucy. And I think it's such, I mean, it's definitely a question I feel like I'm constantly asking myself. I mean, I think I was asking myself in 2016, I was asking myself over and over again, I'm still asking myself that question. And I mean, I think for me personally, it actually always kind of has been. I mean, for me, like storytelling, it's it's a healing thing and storytelling provides catharsis. It's the reason I ever wanted to become, you know, really right. I mean, when I think about like the reason I ever wanted to write plays to begin with was, you know, growing up in New Orleans and with Katrina and, you know, when there was this play called Rising Water and it was about this couple that got trapped in their attic after the storm and just seeing the way people gathered at the theater like around this story and it was just this totally beautiful healing thing and i i still believe that i mean i think as i've gotten older i'm you know i'm less naive about it but i i do think that like you know the same way i was just talking to you about you know dipping into my friend's novel and actually being able to find the sense of solace right now like you know this conversation we've been having over and over and i think when I think about, you know, obviously the theater being totally shut down in this time of pandemic, it's just such a difficult thing to say, you know, it's that entertainment is doing nothing and that literature is doing nothing because what are we all turning to right now? We're all turning to stories. We're always turning to stories for, for help, for support, for joy, you know, for even, you know, grief to be able to see our own grief within storytelling. So, for me, I, it actually really does. I mean, like I feel through art, through making art, through experiencing art, like it's the way that I actually can process emotion, which is both good and bad in terms of past relationships as my wife will tell you. But I, uh, <laughs> I think that uh, it's, yeah, for me, it's, it's kind of everything. So I, I actually do really think it matters. Well, I hope it counts as action because it's one of the only things I seem to be capable of still doing a little yeah. bit. Um, so later I'll read a few of the stories that I actually hand wrote to people during the pandemic and then folded into these little origami shapes and mailed them to people. Um, right now, I've been writing a lot of letters for Vote Forward. And I know that you're involved with them, Lucy. Um, and that's been great because, you know, there, there's a form letter, right? But there's a big space. It's just like the right amount of space to sort of leave your own thing. And it kind of encourages, I think you're literally encouraged to tell your story. You know, I vote in every election because, and then you tell your little story. So I'm not a very woo person. I'll just be frank about that. But I do have this kind of trust that when I take that next piece of paper and I see the name of the person it's going to. And it's of course someone I don't know. So, you know, to Jose in Cleveland or Mary Ellen in Phoenix or, or you know, it's, it's always somebody in a swing state, right? I, I just kind of draw on whatever comes up for me. So for some people, I tell the story about the first time I went to vote. I was 18 and a senior in high school and it must've been a primary. Um, and my dad walked with me to the, the local polling station, which was in a beautiful boathouse at a nearby park. Mm -hmm. And in his way, he told everyone there, I was a first time voter and all the poll workers and all the voters who were in the building at the time clapped, right? And I was like, damn, this is awesome, <laughs> right? Um, so I tell that story to some people. And then for other people, I say, you know, I moved to this country uh, right before my sixth birthday, not speaking a word of English. And, you know, I've had opportunities here and now I teach English to people and I, our voices matter and my voice matters and your voice matters, you know, whoever, whoever you are. Um, and so, you know, it, it could be that most of those stories are actually just going straight into the recycling. <laughs> Somebody, somebody out there is, is opening up a little story from Naomi Williams without knowing who I am or anything and reading a little story and maybe one out of a hundred of those people will be persuaded to actually 
go and make their votes count, you know, this, this year. Um, so, so that feels important. And then I feel like reaching out to people over Zoom or in a phone call or, you know, in, uh, in these various ways that we have now and just telling our stories, even about being sad at level 10 and, you know, fearful at level eight and all that. Um, I think those stories help us too. Our talent sharing our stories of how we're actually doing, which is not that well most of the time right now, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, and I feel like, I, I, for some reason, I just keep thinking back to human, early humans sitting around some fire, you know, back in the very, when they first had language, of course, it wasn't one moment, they all of a sudden had language, but you know what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Telling stories, and, and it's, it's how we explain ourselves to ourselves and to each other. And especially explaining ourselves to each other seems important right now. Having, mm. you know, conversations and telling stories and reading one another's stories across all of our differences. And the more we can do that, um, the better, the more we can share stories that um, involve community um, that comes together. The more we can have conversations like right now where um, people of different um, genders and sexualities and colors come together and share our stories. So I feel like in that way, uh, storytelling is incredibly crucial. And as writers, um, I, I often think of, at, at least as a fiction writer, writing is an act of seduction. So you're trying to seduce your reader into caring and or and or thinking, I, I would like my readers to care and you know feel something and think something as a result of my story. So it's this you know way of trying to bridge ourselves from across all of these crazy divides that right. are so bad right now. One hundred percent. Yeah. Well, so Lucy, I surely you think that storytelling is, counts as action. <laughs> Well, I do more than I used to, which is funny because you'd think um, in this terrible time, I mean, I used to worry about that. Am I just doing this frivolous thing, telling stories? But just sort of based on what I just said, I, I feel it more than ever now that communicating ourselves to one another, and I, I just think story is the best way to communicate. I mean, mm -hmm. I like to frame things in a way that, I mean, there's expression, which is just saying blah, you know, what you write in your journal, and there's communicating, which is actually trying to say something that reaches an audience. So all of us as professional writers are not just like saying what we want to say and getting it on the page to feel better. We're actually trying to take our words and our stories and get them to someone who will usually do something different. I mean, one thing I love about writing um, is that people do something completely different than what you intended, but it's not necessarily worse. Sometimes it's n cooler. Like you get letters from readers and they're like, oh my God, your story made me do blah. And I'm like, wow, I had no idea that it would have that effect, which is kind of neat. But, but then it's a like wee communication too, so. Isn't it kind of both though? I mean, like, I love hearing you say that, Lucy, because I feel like there are a lot of thoughts that I've had personally, especially coming from a very Catholic upbringing, um, you know, like it's, but the idea of, you know, feeling often in my life, like, am I not serving other people or doing something, you know, where I could be like, imp you know, making more of a difference, so to speak, whatever that means. But it's really interesting because I think the battle, like, it's interesting you saying that because it's like, of course, what you're doing is, you know, impacting other people. And as you're saying that you are speaking to, you know, you're trying to move other people, but it's also for us too, right? I mean, I think yes. that if we don't say that, I mean, in the sense of, especially if we're trying to heal with our work, it's like, we're also providing that catharsis for ourselves too, which I don't think is wrong, right? Well, I actually like Naomi used the word voice. And I think especially with girls and women, um, the novel I'm working on right now is about a, a basketball team. And, and, and for me, this was true that through playing sports, I actually, you know, and getting in touch with my body, let me find my voice. And I'm trying to show how that works. And so, yeah, just finding voice means being able to take action in other ways, mm -hmm. um, especially for women and girls who yeah. have more trouble doing that, I think, than, than men. It's true. You know, I, I'm just remembering something that happened four years ago. So I was teaching a, an undergraduate creative writing class, like exactly four years ago. So I had to go in and teach this workshop the day after the, the election. Mm. And, you know, a big part of me just wanted to cancel class. Just say, let's just do self-care today. But I was like, no, I need to be there. Yeah. 
I really didn't know what to do. I just went in and I said, we're not doing what's on the syllabus today. We're obviously not doing that. And so we just kind of had this free flowing discussion. And at one point I said, is anyone here feeling like storytelling doesn't matter anymore? That like what we do here doesn't matter anymore. And I thought I was going to have to launch a big defense of that. And I wasn't even sure how I felt about that on November 9th, 2016. Yeah. Like this one woman who'd been crying, right? So these are all very young people. You know, the oldest person in that class was, was maybe 25, a returning student who with this group yeah. of like, you know, very early 20s um, undergrads. This one woman who'd been crying, like looked up at me in, across the seminar table and said, of course it matters, Professor Williams. Like it matters more than ever. And I was like, oh, okay. I thought I was coming here to minister to the students. And it was <laughs> totally 100% the other way around. Yeah. And, and I keep remembering those young people in that yeah. class and the way they held that space for each other and for mm -hmm. me that day. And it's four years later and nothing has improved and, and we're all scared and freaked out. But I still remember that young woman telling me through her tears but really clearly like mm -hmm. of course this matters more yeah. than ever yeah. yeah that's interesting that you say that because I was teaching at a high school at the time and that day is so clear to me with those students who felt very similarly I mean the sort of the reactions and the way people sort of they kind of banded together and I've been thinking about a lot of them actually coming of age and being able to some of the, so many of them were bemoaning that they couldn't vote you know Right. And I've been thinking about them so much because now I don't teach there anymore, but like thinking about them and like coming of age and that's interesting. Yeah. 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 You recently spent some time in LA, which I just was so impressed. You like left your wife for a <laughs> series of months, went and lived in LA and worked on this TV show. So that's like a whole other realm of storytelling. Yeah. I'm curious how that impacted you as a novelist and a playwright um, and, and what that experience was like as a storyteller. Um, kind of like well, you were in the belly of the beast. It was, <laughs> LA is so interesting. It's such a specific, I'm in, New, I'm in New York, by the way, for those of you all who don't know. Um, and I've been in New York for about a decade, grew up in New Orleans. Um, I, LA was great in a lot of ways because it really grounded me and made me, it actually made me just so grateful that I had been, that it took me that long to, to, you know, not even kind of on purpose. I mean, I actually sort of had kind of ended up sort of working now in like kind of television film realm through theater specifically. And I was just so grateful that I had my own writing life and I had kind of figured out who I am as a writer before getting to Hollywood mm -hmm. because I could see the allure of, you know, the paycheck <laughs> especially mm -hmm. and how that could bring you to an, an early stage before you really know who you are as a writer and, and just how dangerous that is actually. Um, and I met some pretty amazing writers, but it's, um, it really is just like a different world and it, and it and it just made me value again like my own writing my own my own work that I could say like I can navigate you know of course like with any type of writing be it fiction be it a play you know a lot of people think playwriting is a very collaborative form in a lot of ways but not the way television writing is you don't have 10 heads in the room and a showrunner telling you this is what I want it to look like with a studio head saying this is how it has to be you know what I mean it's it really is you know, in theater, you, the playwright is king in a lot of ways. And, you know, when you're writing a novel, yes, of course, you're collaborating with an editor or with, you know, everyone else, you know, it's, but it's just a different beast. And so I, it just made me appreciate being able to like return to my own space <laughs> and my own work. <laughs> and I, but I like love it. You know, it's, I, 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 I'm a writer. I mean, I think you know this about me, Lucy. I love working across genre. Like, I'm just that kind of writer, honestly. And I, I feel like it, working in other forms just makes me stronger and more hungry to work in other forms, you know? Um, so it was an experience, <laughs> but really great. And I actually got to connect to the literary community, which was awesome. Like I read at Stories and um, met a bunch of people. I was there for the Land of Lit Fest, which was awesome. And um, so, yeah, it was, it was a really, it was a, a strange like five month period of time of like just living. Also, you know, when you've been living in one place for a decade, it's like funny to like live somewhere else actually and like 
commute, you know, I'm so used to being in New York. I haven't, I hadn't driven a car every day <laughs> for literally for like 10 years. It was so crazy. I mean, I can drive, you know, I'll rent a car or whatever, but like to actually commute every day was such a weird, different experience. So it was like sort of stepping into a different life. <laughs> so cool. Um, I want to be sure, I want to get in our little mini readings. So I was wondering, Naomi, if you wanted to, uh, your project with the origami was so cool, your pandemic project. Is that what you were going to read, uh, a few of those? Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, let me tell you a little bit about how that started. So this is even before we all were, in, were, were before we were all super aware that the U.S. Postal Service was in trouble, right? But I've always liked the idea of receiving snail mail much more than I was willing to commit to writing letters, you know? Um, like, I love the idea of it, and, and I really have written very few letters in my life. But when we stopped being able to see each other, especially when California went into lockdown, I just thought, you know what? It would be wonderful to send mail to people, and it would be wonderful to get some letters back. Um, but, but partly it was just the shock to the system of suddenly being in the middle of a global pandemic did sort of put a stop to all of my writing. Like I just, I just couldn't really function. And I thought, well, at least I can send a letter to someone. So I very tentatively put out on both Facebook and Twitter, like if I said I would write you a real letter, like would you want one? And like 85 people like, you know, immediately were like, I want a letter, I want a letter, right? So, and I actually have never gotten through the whole list. I need to like, after the election or whatever, I need to get back to it and finish writing to those people. Um, but I did send out 70, 75, something like that. Yeah. After a while, I started, um, well, I had some really weird stationery. Some of it was from Japan and, and Japanese stationery goods are just sort of uh, a, a beast unto themselves. And I'd had some of these for note cards and things for something like 20 years. They weren't super appropriate to send for regular mail, but during the pandemic, I was like, I don't care. Some of this really goofy stationery with goofy lurid pictures or very strange English, I'm just sending it all, right? Um, and some of, so, uh, some of them I started writing little tiny stories to sort of go with the stationery. And then after a while, I started sending little stories with every letter, regardless of what kind of stationery was on. And so one of the things I did was I, I folded little pieces of origami. So this is a tiny little boat, right? It, it needed to be something really, really simple that I could do quickly and that could be unfolded quickly. And not so fancy that somebody was loath to unfold it, you know. Although even with this very simple thing, I did get a few like emails and letters back saying, I unfolded my story and now I'm sad because I can't fold it back yeah, up. I would be loath to unfold that. Yeah. yeah. I feel like um, I would too. It's so, yeah. it looks so beautiful. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, that's, it, this, this one's really simple. So I wanted to have one to show during the, the event tonight. And I was struggling with it because it's been a couple months since I folded one. So my, my younger son, Elliot, is living with us now. He's in college and doing this remotely. And, and he's the real origami artist in the family. And I was like struggling with this. And he was like, you want me to do that for you, mom? And I was like, yes, I'm late for my, I'm late for my reading. And so, so he actually folded this little one. But the ones that got folded into boats, there were several shapes I did. The ones that got folded into boats ended up being about boats. Right. And so I thought of them because, Lucy, many of your stories in Lava Falls involve people in boats. Yeah. Or ships or like on the water or something, including that lovely opening story, Girl with Boat. Mm. Um, but also the title story, Lava Falls. There's just a lot of, of you know, that's all about boating. Um, so I picked out three of these tiny stories and I thought I'd just read them. They're all extremely short. Um, OK, so. One of them, um, I had this kind of paper, except it was all checkerboard. It didn't have this um, stationary black stuff on it. So um, th this was folded into something of checkerboard inside and out. And this was for my friend, Teresa Herlinger, who lives in Portland. That spring, she took long walks by herself along the river. And every day she saw a funny little boat, something between a rowboat and a canoe painted inside and out with a pattern of black and white checks, tied up at a point on the path where an old oak leaned dangerously and wantonly out over the water. She didn't know who, if anyone, owned it, 
but she never saw anyone using it. So one morning she untied it and rode across the slow moving river and back and felt very daring and brave. No one chided her for it. So she started taking the boat for short excursions, even going as far as, and then one day under the bridge where she might be seen rowing a boat that was not hers. Her arms grew strong from the rowing, but what she appreciated most about the boat next to its availability and steady river worthiness was the way it was exactly the same inside and out. Black and white checks inside, black and white checks outside. She didn't know that many things and certainly no people of which or of whom that could be said. Okay, okay so that's the checkerboard boat story. Um, a, another story that was written in a similarly shaped origami, uh, I sent to my friend Robin Beth Sher, who is a marvelous poet in, uh, who lives in Ohio. Um, she has a marvelous collection called Ship Breaking. That is a lot about ships and being on ships. Uh, so this, this was the story for Robin. They found it pulled up in front of their house as if it had been rowed there and abandoned. The water sloshing about in the bottom smelled like a river. The oars pulled in the boat and laid across the seats were still damp. But they didn't live near any water. The ocean was a thousand miles away and it took more than an hour to reach any navigable water or recreation involving boats. So it was puzzling this boat, especially as no one claimed it. They asked all their neighbors and even posted about it online. Their child loved the boat and started playing in it every day and they let him as there seemed no harm to it. And if this were a fable, a flood would come and save the family. And if this were a ghost story, the child would disappear one day along with the boat. But it's only a story of ordinary mystery. So the boat remained there for years. And I bet it's still there now, although that child would now be a man. So why don't I just stop there with those two little stories? <laughs> and I wanna mention that Naomi's novel, Landfalls, which is just extraordinary. Is, well, I want to say it's about a ship, but it's actually about being off the ship, right? And mostly, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so it's, if you haven't read it, you must. Thank you. Yeah. Such a cool concept. I love that. I Thank love you. That. I'm sort of obsessed with mail. Like I have this like ongoing um, postcard thing that I've literally been sending postcards out for uh, like over a decade and I just like love mail. I love mail projects. I like, that's such a neat, I love, I love it how you like kind of created your own prompt. It's so cool. Well, and you know, like I put it out on Twitter and I thought just a few like friends of mine who follow me on Twitter would ask for a letter or friends on Facebook, but I had total strangers who didn't follow me on Twitter somehow find, found oh. out about the project and like send me messages from places like England saying, or Australia saying like, I, I want a letter. Okay, you'll get a letter. <laughs> it was, so it was cool because I was writing to total strangers and sending some of them little handwritten pieces of fiction I thought up on the spot. I love that so much. And it's I not that different. Writing. It's not that different than these people checking your books out of a library, you know? Yeah, that's true. People read our work who don't know us. That's true. Yeah, that's true. But you know, the other thing is, I think it can be helpful to do like low stakes writing right now. You know what I mean? Like. Okay. Because the high, there's so much that's high stakes right now in the world, mm -hmm. and, and it's very difficult for us to sort of focus and concentrate on our own kind of high stakes projects, but the low stakes stuff I have found doable. Well, that's true, but the, the novel I'm working on right now, I actually find in the last, as things have gotten so bleak in the last few months, my revisions have gotten much bleaker and more urgent and more disturbing. Right. Um, Probably in a good way, I'm probably going deeper, but I'm, you know, I feel like I am able to use this rage and this grief in the work. So yeah, I'm, I feel like, yeah, somehow the stakes are almost higher and I feel that as I'm working. I also, one thing I really, I was gonna ask you all about working while sheltering in place and I'm not able to concentrate anywhere near as long as I usually can. So there's that, but I am writing every day um, just for shorter periods of time. But I find that um, one of my, Maybe my biggest fault, I don't know, is impatience. I'm a very impatient person. But with this, all this shit going on, <laughs> I'm kind of like, well, you know, I have all the time in the world because what am I going to do with this novel? And it made me more patient. And I actually think I'm doing better work because I'm just taking my time with it rather than thinking, got to get it out, got to get it out. You know, so I don't know if sheltering in place is having any side effects like for me, it's more urgent and bleak and also more patient. Mm, interesting. 
It's it's interesting to think of it as like a like a paradoxical kind of thing because I, I you know it's funny because like when when everything first started to happen it was I was about to go into a workshop for a, a new play, and I had just come off of working on this show, uh, to this television show, and I was like um, because I and I was put, then I had another play that was going up. And I, because everything got shut down theater wise, I was like, I have time to work on my book. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, it was like this like really freeing kind of thing where I was like, I actually have this space. Like I was like, if I literally just utilize this time, like thinking about like, honestly, in my head, I was like, well, let's see, probably within the next six months, I probably won't be staffed. So I can literally use this like, crunch of time is like perfect like it it can be and so I it kind of became this like oasis that it was like this space and time that I could focus on this project that otherwise I wouldn't have probably had the same amount of time to be able to really focus on the first draft and really just like let it kind of be I've been um, trying to use that mindset, like, this is a residency, this is a residency. I sort of had to, <laughs> but it's hard though. Like, the rage and the craziness and stuff. Yeah, and, and I was trying to get out of the productivity. I mean, I feel like I have a problem. Like, I, I think it is, like, also a very, like, millennial, like, I, I, the, the productivity mindset thing. Like, I think I have a, a bit of that problem. Um, and so I even would have times when I would be like, oh, my God, I didn't hit my word count goal. And then I was like, what does it matter? Which is like a global, <laughs> like, we're in a pandemic. Like, just get over. It's okay. Like, nobody's, like, dying to read your book right now. <laughs> like, this is... Right, right. Um, but it's, it's, it's interesting to hear you say that. And Naomi, you were saying that this was just sort of your way to focus, like, was working on this project. Well, this. It, it actually helped that productivity thing, because I, I come from, you know, kind of Japanese and, and oddly, also Calvinist stock. Mm -hmm. And um, so I've got that, like, I, you know, I have to work, 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 work. And yeah, so yeah. At, at least it ticked off one box on my to-do list, which was write a letter, write <laughs> a tiny story. Yeah. And it was like, okay, I can do that. Check, check. Right. And it made me feel better. Yeah. Plus when I didn't, I'm a very um, slow writer. I'm, I'm too much of a perfectionist. I'll, I'll, I'll work the same page just, you know, for months, literally. And here it was like, no, once I start writing on this piece of paper, I'm not going to stop until I filled it. And then I can't throw it away. Mm. Right. So then I would just send it. And, and it kind of helped me get over that hump too, of it all has to be perfect. Cool. And part of that is kind of like, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Send, send, send somebody a story. Just do it. Who cares if it's not great? Like, just do it. Right. Love um, that. It's going to make somebody so, and I didn't have to worry like, oh, no one's going to read this. I knew one person would read it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and you're sa and you're saving them like you're are you gathering them? I I took a photograph of every single story. Cool. Oh, that's so cool. I want to mention to the audience, um, if you have questions, you want to put them in the chat and stuff. We're going to get to that in a minute. So, uh, I think we're we're on Zoom and Evan is streaming it to y'all. And he's going to copy your questions over to us on oh, Zoom. Wow. If you have thoughts and questions, let us know. So much um, technology. DQ, you want to read uh, something? Sure, sure. I, I wish that I had like a very cool associate. I literally was just going to read a, like a page, you know, a little bit from this new book project. Um, That's perfect. And then I'll read my page and then we'll see if there's questions. That sounds great. Okay, I'll keep, I'll keep it short and sweet. Um, so this is from... This project, The Twisted Fate of La Media Luna, is, is the title of it. Um, Much like none presumed their own birth, none anticipated the storm, the flood, or what followed. Not Ophelia, not Evangeline, not any living soul on La Media Luna. Yet fate calls and we answer as we must. The ancient island La Media Luna brimmed with uncommon buoyancy, rocked to sleep each night by the warm sea, a tiny tropical crescent-shaped oasis hugged by crystalline waters, its origins as varied as jambalaya, touches of Africa, Europe, Asia, the Americas wrapped into a soul all its own. Some called the island nation paradise, others an anomaly for more than its temperament. Despite La Media Luna's precarious location, storms passed over La Media Luna with eerie confidence. According to legend, the island's earliest Santero struck a deal with Doña herself, in a direct act against her own parent god, Yurei, 
and cast a protective spell upon its fabled isle so that no tempest, man-made or nature-born, could trouble its shores beyond a rainstorm, and to date, none had. Even as waters warmed, storms strengthened across the globe, and disaster after hurricane wrecked islands and beaches near and far, La Media Luna remained unscathed. Of course, not all believed the myth, but even skeptics could not quite explain how else the island might have gone unpunished for so many years. Despite her name, Doña was not old. She wasn't particularly young either. Timeless in the way of the gods, she embodied both the elegance of a queen and the swagger of a cowboy, depending on her mood. When she took human form, her sleek raven black braids resembled a lion's mane, her skin like golden honey. She frequently took the shape of the numerous royal palms that peppered the island like a thick beard. Gossips beware, a palm frond rustling in the breeze might prove to be Doña listening in on a seemingly private conversation. Yet, since Doña demonstrated herself to be a peaceful god, La Media Lunans believed her eavesdropping, if even true beyond the tales, to be a small price to pay for paradise. Mm. I'll stop there. Awesome. Wow, that was beautiful. Oh, thank you. That put me in mind of, um, I'm, I'm reading Tar Baby right now. Oh my gosh, I, ha I haven't actually read it. Oh my goodness, you, you, you must, because I, must I feel like it. you're channeling something there. I'm, that's cool. I, I will definitely, I will definitely I appreciate friends. that. Thank you. When Pat and I were in New York once, we got to see one of uh, CQ's plays. What, which, what play was that that we got to see? It was so amazing. Did you, amazing. See, did you see Enter Your Sport? Sleep? What? It was Enter Your Sleep? I, I'm not good with titles. That doesn't oh, no, you saw Evensong about, it's a... Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah, was that was so, so cool that you guys came. Yeah. I loved it. It was so perfect. Yeah. It was, it was, it's a play of mine about the working homeless population that I was premiered at APAC in 2016. That's so cool. I forgot you guys came to that. That's yeah, awesome. yeah, we did. It was great. We were just like in New York. It's like, oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Happening. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's, I'm, this is, this is the baby. This is that it is being born of the pandemic. For me, so. That's cool. Well, Evans just told us that we're getting a lot of love, but no questions. Um, <laughs> So I'll take the love. That's cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll go ahead. I have a, just one page I'm going to read from Lava Falls. That's just come out in paper. Um, and Naomi and I had emailed back and forth and she was saying that she was going to, you know, maybe do a couple of the boat origami stories. And since so many of my stories have, there, there's the Antarctic ships. Actually, there are, there's two Antarctic stories that have ships yep. in them. Okay. I'd never thought about that. How many boats and ships? I, I sometimes joke that I've never written a story in my life that didn't have a tent somewhere in it, but I guess half true of boats. However, I'm going to not do that. Um, I decided I wanted to read the first page of a story uh, called The End of Jesus. Um, I have been writing a whole lot lately about the Christian right. Um, I kind of can't stop. I did a couple stories and now I'm working on a novel about the Christian right. And um, I read a really interesting article in Slate just yesterday morning. Um, I have this really bad habit of waking up and immediately looking at my phone and, you know, hoping that somebody has moved along in some way, um, but they haven't. But anyway, I saw this article about I, I don't say the people's names anymore, but I saw this article on Slate. This was, woman was saying that McC well, I'm just about to say his name, that guy who's head of the Senate and what he's doing with uh, um, um, RBG's place is not, we, we keep saying it's hypocritical and that's the wrong word. And it, it was, so, I, I'm not gonna be as articulate as this woman who wrote the article and I also forget her name, I'm sorry, but it's like beyond hypocritical. It's like, um, they know what they're doing. They know we know what they're doing. They don't care. They enjoy our angst. I mean, it's like, it's yeah. satanic. <laughs> I don't think I'm prone to hyperbole. It's like, it's beyond hypocritical. But anyway, that's a long introduction to say, and I'm trying to write about these people and understand the impact they've had on my life and, and a lot of our lives and um, my fear of the impact they will have. But this story is called The End of Jesus. I'm just gonna read the first page. I'm just gonna read it right from the book. Um, I don't think, since I'm reading the first page, I don't need to introduce a thing. Mac had been gone for more than 30 years. So when I found her little book in Powell's, 
I collapsed in shock, dropped right there onto the bookstore's wood plank floor in a dusty splotch of sunlight coming from a high window. In my trembling hands, I held the book that had failed to save Mac's life, though it had saved mine. I'd come back to Oregon for my mother's memorial service, which would be taking place in under an hour, and I'd walked to the bookstore in a kind of trance that was a combination of grief and dread. The city of books was a comfort, all those words, all that knowledge, the vast diversity of human experience. I strolled through the store's many rooms as an antidote to the service I was about to attend, where everyone would believe in one and only one truth. I considered staying in the bookstore, skipping my mother's memorial service. That blasphemous thought made me touch the books for grounding, for random guidance, and I dragged my hand along the row of bumpy spines. And there it was. I would have known it anywhere. The unassuming slim girth, the short red spine with the white lettering, Max Book. It wasn't just the title, it was the very book, her copy. I knew this because when I opened it and flipped through, I found a section of blank pages in the back. On the first of these pages was the printed no word notes. Here the book owner was supposed to write down her own observations and Mac had with brief discretion. She had written, June 10th, Sylvia. Mm. June 14, Sylvia, Sylvia. June 30th, Sylvia, Sylvia, Sylvia. August 9, Robin's Rocks. August 18, Hell. September 9, How to Survive. October 12, The End of Jesus. That August 9 entry, that's me, Robin. I'd lived under an entire rock pile of guilt ever since, but apparently it hadn't been misplaced. I was one of the three people she named in the season of her demise. Sylvia, me, and Jesus. Mm. Oh my gosh, it looks like we have a question. Uh, Nina wants to know from uh, CQ, what were you working on in LA? And someone uh, says, laugh out loud. I had the same question. <laughs> <laughs> I was working on a, a show on ABC called The Baker and the Beauty, um, which was a like, talking about rom-coms it was like a delightful like a cuban american family in miami little havana um and uh, about like a baker who falls it's like kind of like a cinderella story in reverse this baker falls in love with this like superstar kind of thing and has it already played it did it premiered and we didn't get renewed for a second season but we it premiered in oh my gosh now like feels like a lifetime ago in april in april yeah can we see it like on Netflix or something? Yeah, it's on Hulu. It's all on Hulu. It's a blast. It's a good, it's very good COVID material to watch. It's That's a lot of fun. Good. And for this moment, it's a good, like, if you're looking, and there's a really sweet, like, um, the young, the, so like the, there's two really great queer characters, which is awesome. And it's, it's fun. It's like, if you're into like a fun family, like romp, it's like, it's a good, it's a good. So tell us the name of it again. It's called The Baker and the Beauty. The Baker okay. and the Beauty. You know, it's funny because whenever you, you read that, that story in particular, I don't often, like, it's so annoying because we're living in such an IP heavy moment, like where everybody's always like, what can be adapted? What can be adapted? But I really do think that story would be such a great short film. Yeah. Is Every time, like, like, just reading it, your yeah. Jesus story, I, I think it would be, I can, like, see it. Oh, yeah. you're talking about me. Yeah, I'm talking about that story. <laughs> oh. I literally can see it so clearly. Yeah. I could see the bookstore. I could see the book. I could see, like, it's just, it's so clear as it's, it feels like a short film in, like, a lot of ways. Like, I think, like, the right director could really do it justice. Yeah, that would be wonderful. <laughs> um, I also think you have a real, um, just, kind of genius for openings. Lucy, uh, like as I was reading this, you know, I'm, I'm not teaching this sem semester, but I've been thinking, I know people who would really learn a lot from, and, and myself included, but, but you know, as, as a teacher, I'm, I'm like often looking for like good contemporary stuff to, to share with my students. I'm like, wow, well, some of this, I mean, all the stories are really great, but some of the openers in particular, mm. just like, I could teach a whole class on like, like, let's just look at this one page. That's such a good point. Yeah. The author has done here. Yeah, so. My okay. dear friend, Barb Johnson, who I think is, on, is, is here with us, uh, taught Girl with Boat just like a week or two ago, I think. So I was very oh, pleased cool. that you did that. Yeah, yeah. Did any of that come from dream, from like a dream, right? I mean, and there are questions that people want to ask you guys. So I feel like, but I, I actually, that I, there's something about that story that feels so 
like coming from like an unconscious state, you know, like. It's interesting you should say that. I mean, not literally from a dream, but um, my best friend and I, when we were little girl, I mean, I've just, we, we would, I don't know why I bring her into it. I would spend, I've spent all of my childhood figuring out how to survive in places. Like I would, you know, be in the car with my family and I would say, okay, there's a park with a lot of shrubbery. I could probably live there for a long time and I could walk. I like always, I spent a lot of time figuring out how I could live in wild places and I continue to do it. Um, so um, I've been, yeah, I've always been obsessed with survival on a biological level and with human beings as actually a species of animal and get so frustrated when other people don't realize we are. Um, so a lot of my stories come from that place. Definitely. Lucy, that explains so much. <laughs> that story about the young Lucy. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. Um, Ron has a question here for me. Uh, he very kindly says, Lava Fall has so many great characters. How do you imagine or inhabit your people, especially if they're very different from you? Oh, that's mm -hmm. such a good question. Um, it's, it's, a, it, it's a big question. Um, I love writing characters different from myself and I realize there's an enormous responsibility in doing that because I'm bound to make mistakes. Um, but one of my joys of writing is to imagine, I mean, I, I bore myself silly. I've, you know, I've been this person who's been looking at bushes and wondering how I could live under them for, you know, a lot of decades. Um, and I love trying to imagine what makes other people tick and think. And that's why I love writing fiction is imagining myself in other people's shoes. But um, so um, I spend a lot of time thinking about that. I'm not a very fun dinner guest in restaurants because I'm just so interested in the conversation going at the next table. <laughs> Um, so I, spend, I do a lot of observation um, I, and then when I write characters that are very different from myself, I, I try to have a lot of different people read the story, especially people who have the background or the job or the skin color or the gender of who I've written to, um, to make sure I haven't made big errors. Um, but it's fun to write people different from me and my community is full of people different from me. So I want to portray that community in my stories. Um, here's a question from Dorothy for CQ. When you get an idea for a story, oh, and also a question after that for Naomi, but we'll start with the one for CQ. When you get an idea for a story, how do you know, oh, that's a good question. How do you know what genre it will be? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think honestly, um, it's, it really is how it first kind of comes to me. I know it sounds silly, but like, I sometimes really think in dialogue. Like, I think that's why naturally I sort of like gravitated toward playwriting even when I was writing fiction initially. Um, and so I find like sort of the way it moves, if that makes sense. Like, if it feels like it's really moving. What do you mean about that? What do you mean the way it moves? The way it moves. Like if it's, you know, it's funny if I can like really see it it's definitely probably more of something like, it's funny, like this novel project, I knew that it wanted to be a novel. It needed, it needed that kind of space, that kind of like narrative space that like couldn't exist like in a play. I, like I was just kind of saying, I think we're in such an adaptation happy moment that like it's really a careful tricky thing. Like I don't think things should be adapted as much as they are, <laughs> honestly. Mm -hmm. um, but I think like I, I tend to just like, honestly, I sound silly. I, I wish I could, it's kind of a gut thing. Or like in some ways it's like, is it more dialogue driven? Is it more visually driven? Um, I've had things where like, I actually, uh, my pilot actually started as a short, a short play that it just felt like it needed to be on film. It felt like this very visual world, like it needed to be that. Um, and then like I've had certain instincts that have been wrong and yeah, like I've shifted turns, but I feel like it's kind of like a gut thing. And I feel like actually for the most part, my thing, like my plays are very much plays and my work that exists in other forms are very much that. But then at the same time, I feel like everybody calls all of my work poetic. So like whatever that means, you know what I mean? Like it's across <laughs> genre. Um, but I feel like it's just like, it's fun. I think right, and when you're first drafting, and I, I don't, I'm sure, I don't, I don't know, but I'm sure like Lucy and Naomi feel this, but I feel like anytime you're drafting to really just like allow the work, I really try hard. I'm a very, I can be very logical. 
And I try really hard to sort of access that unconscious, the dream space, and to just sort of let it take me where it wants to go. And I think um, I really try to listen to that, like at first, especially. I hope that's helpful. Dorothy also has a question for Naomi. Has, the, has writing the letters changed how you approach your longer form writing? You know, I, I don't know that it has. Uh, writing the letters has kept me putting the pen literally to paper. I, usually when people say that, they actually mean tapping on a keyboard, but this was literally putting pen to paper, which felt very therapeutic in some way um, and mm -hmm. also allowed me to accomplish things. But the novel that I've been working on is now late, and um, and and I I've, I've made a lot of research progress on the novel, but not a lot of drafting progress on the novel, um, which is going to have to happen. So I don't know if it's really changed my approach. It has made I will tell you what it has done though in, in a more crafty way. It's really made me appreciate flash fiction and just mm -hmm. the flash form, even flash essays too, because. You can actually get a lot done in 100, 200, 300 words. Yeah. And yeah. And I've come to really, really, really appreciate that. Do you? I've often wondered what, how spending the first six years of your life in Japan and then coming here and learning a whole new language has affected your creative vision. You know, I'm sure that it has. Um, I, I think... You know, I haven't thought exactly about how it does that. I'm sure that it has. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I definitely feel Japanese in some very um, pointed ways. Although when I go to Japan, I often feel extremely American. Mm. I, I mean, here's, here's what being a kind of immigrant, and I say kind of because my father was an American citizen and white and a serviceman in Japan when he met my mother, who is Japanese. So I came to this country and I didn't speak any English then, but I was always an American citizen, having been born on mm -hmm. an Air Force base. So I have I, I occupied this very strange like immigrant status. That's not really immigrant, right? Um, but um, I have I definitely have felt like an outsider all, all the time, right? Um, I did in Japan when I was a child and the you know Japanese kids called me gaijin which means foreigner right and I did when I came here and then I got called Jap and other terrible things um, and I think for a long long time my even you know children can learn languages with amazing sort of like freakish facility right um, six months after moving here mm -hmm. I was basically fluent but I, I was, I would become strangely aware of these gaps in my linguistic knowledge. All the way through high school, I would sometimes realize there was some incredibly common word. I just didn't know. Like I just had missed that memo um, in those formative years. So, and I know that all writers feel like outsiders. That's partly what draws us to writing, I think. But, but there's this kind of um, not belonging to any particular culture or country that definitely informs my work. All of my stories, no matter how different they are, are about people leaving home and going to usually to some other country where they don't feel like they belong. <laughs> Those are just the stories I'm drawn to. Yeah. Um, we're almost out of time, but uh, CQ, Margaret wants to know um, if you could elaborate on what you mean by adaptation happy. <laughs> Sorry, I realize I said that a lot, but I also just wanted to say that Naomi, I would love to see a book of like that the flash fiction of your of your origami stories, like with actually images of the of the origami pieces, like almost like I would love to see that as like a visual book, almost like um, like Anne Carson, that would be fun, Knox, like kind of you know. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, adaptation happy. What I mean by that is I feel like right now, especially like kind of in the golden era of television, um, there, it's so common that it's just like, like a book even before it's published is like, oh, this would be an amazing film or this is a TV show, this is, and it's like, yeah, sometimes, but I think so often it's like, what's sad about that is like, we miss out on like, what's beautiful about the form of a novel and that so often like a novel, the way that it's built 
is built as a novel because it's meant to be a novel and it probably doesn't work well as a film. I mean, I think there are like incredible examples of like, I mean, Renaldo Arenas's, you know, Before Night Falls, I think the adaptation of that book is such a brilliant adaptation because it's not trying to be the novel in an exact way. But I, that's what I mean by it, is that I think that so often we're so quick to say like, let's adapt this or can this be a film? Can this be TV? And like, listen, total respect for like, get that paycheck girl. But I think that, uh, <laughs> I think that like sometimes it's like, let's appreciate the book, you know, because it's beautiful as a book. <laughs> That's all. I always like to close um, events with a, like a 15 second little bit of something. So I'm going to do that. But first of all, I just, you guys have, Cheered up. You've taken my sadness from the 10 down to a seven. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Same. That's a big leap. Same. That is a big jump. Big yeah, thanks. The same. Oh, same. Love you both. Same. All your thoughts and energy and, and being here to help me celebrate and all of you in the audience too, which is a little weird because in Zoom, we can see you, but we're not in Zoom with you. But mm. um, thank you so very much. So I'm just going to read this little 15 second thing. One time at a reading, I said that, and I accidentally said something like 15 minutes, and the audience is like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so this is the epigraph that I start uh, my story, Lava Falls, with. Um, Lava Falls is a novella that anchors this collection, but this little epigraph is actually a quote from Edward Abbey um, from his book, Desert Solitaire. So this is our Edward Abbey's words, not mine. Night and day the river flows. If time is the mind of space, the river is the soul of the desert. Brave boatmen come, they go, they die, the voyage flows on forever. We are all canyoneers. We are all passengers on this little living mossy ship, this delicate dory sailing around the sun that humans call the earth. Joy, shipmates, joy. Mm -hmm. So thank you all so much. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you, um, Lucy, CQ, um, Naomi. This has been really um, a wonderful conversation. And um, uh, I think um, my, my levels um, have dropped significantly, too. Um, Yay. So, well, thank um, you, Evan. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, Evan. Thank you, everyone. Thanks to everyone out there. Thank you uh, for yes. being here, y'all. Thanks for being here, everyone. Um, go buy books from booksmith.com right now. And um, hopefully, we'll, um, we'll see you all in person soonish. Um, but until then, um, We'll take the we'll take the zooms. Um, glad to be able to to meet here and and to have these conversations. Um, Lucy, congratulations on the paperback. Um, be you. well. Um, take care. Bye, everybody. Have a good night. Bye. Thank good you night. so much.